So petroleum and natural gas, these are our fossil fuels. They are actually uh, frozen sunlight, if you want to think about it that way. Petroleum, thick, dark, mostly comprising hydrocarbons. Uh, hydrocarbons are compounds that contain hydrogen and oxygen. Natural gas primarily comprises methane, uh, but you also see some ethane, propane, and butane in there. Um, a lot <laughs> we have managed to, in the U.S., largely stall petroleum prices uh, and keep them from going up uh, because we're not using as much oil as electricity generating fuel. Uh, the price for coal has gone down, and a lot of that has to do with uh, being more efficient at our, our capturing natural gas and the overall efficiency of converting natural gas into uh, mechanical motion that will drive a turbine that will then generate electricity. So um, if we kind of look at our historical sources of where did we get energy, uh, you know, 1850s, it was mostly wood and coal. Right? Uh, then you start getting some petroleum and natural gas right around the beginning, end of the 18, uh, was it 1890 or something that they first struck oil up in uh, Pennsylvania and oil became a, a more viable source of, of energy. I mean, you still had things like whale oil for lamps, so you weren't completely oil independent, but, you know, large sources of energy, right? Uh, we really started to get into the use of coal in the 1900s, started to pull in some natural gas uh, right after World War II happened. We moved into the age of diesel, uh, petroleum, natural gas became way more important. Uh, the use of coal is still very high, it's remained pretty high, some were hovering around 20%. Uh, you know, I think it's dropped a little bit in the last 20 years. Um, you know, our, our natural gas is still pretty, is still pretty high, uh, mainly because we're using so much more natural gas than we used to. Uh, you know, I think wood is probably dropped a little bit. We have seen a little bit more hydro, nuclear, and solar. Um, coal is going to be formed from the remains of plants, buried and subject to pressures, uh, pressure and heat for long periods of time, uh, basically converting the uh, organic compounds, which contain carbon, into pretty much just carbon. Uh, you've got different kinds of coal. So you got lignite, which is low-value coal. Uh, it's <laughs> it's basically really hard peat. A sub-bituminous coal, uh, which is a little bit older and denser. Um, bituminous coal, uh, that's you know, really a high sulfur coal. Uh, and then anthracite, that's that's hard coal. Um, I I kind of grew up in. <coughs> a coal using area and when I was little we had an anthracite coal furnace and it was my job to go downstairs at six o'clock in the morning and you know shake out all the coal ash from the grate and put new coal on the fire to keep us warm during the winter and yeah there is a definite difference between bituminous and anthracite coal if you are a fan of Thomas the tank engine uh, Henry the engine is particular about his Welsh coal, which is going to be anthracite high-value coal. Um, it's about 20% of the U.S. energy uh, is going to use coal. Uh, mining is expensive and dangerous. Um, it can cause a lot of pollution because you'll have sulfur compounds in there as well. Uh, in addition to uh, the output of sulfur, which is really bad on... Uh, producing acid rain. Uh, that's why we don't. That's why we don't want to use uh, high sulfur diesel fuel. Uh, that's why all the diesel fuel has to be, uh, you know, PPB levels of sulfur, and so that you're not producing uh, sulfur that goes into the atmosphere and turns into acid rain. Uh, when you burn a fossil fuel and you undergo that combustion reaction, you are going to generate both CO2. Uh, and H2O, both of those are greenhouse gases, but they're going to have different magnitudes of effect. So um, you know, things like 0.4% CO2 in the atmosphere, or something. It's, it's not a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, but it's a way more effective uh, greenhouse gas than water is. Um, and some of those fluorocarbons uh, are going to be even more effective at being a greenhouse gas. Uh, greenhouse effect is characterized by an increase in temperature observed 
like in a greenhouse. So in an actual greenhouse, we've got glass walls. They're transparent to visible light and absorb infrared radiation. Um, in our atmosphere, our greenhouse gases are going to block the escape of infrared re-radiation from the atmosphere, causing an increase in temperature on the planet. And there is a direct correlation between the amount of global CO2, carbon dioxide, and the global temperature. So uh, these two guys are tracking with each other really well. So as you increase global CO2, uh, global temperature is going up as well. Um, wind is another source of energy. Hundreds of wind farms have been set up in the Midwest, and we are producing more than 1,000 megawatts that can be generated by a large wind farm. Our total wind capacity in the U.S. is about 60,000 megawatts, and that keeps going up. Um, there are some disadvantages. Uh, obviously, the wind is not blowing all the time. Um, it's also not necessarily an issue with generation. Uh, it's also an issue with storage and distribution. So when they're talking about uh, infrastructure, if the wind is blowing during the day, but you've got a high power load at night, you want some way to store that power. Uh, the cost of electricity from wind sources is higher than that from conventional sources. Uh, if you <laughs> and, and plus, like some of those wind turbines are really, really big, giant, ma like, the scale of these things, if you've ever seen, been up close on one of them, it's it's frighteningly large. Like even the blades are are absolutely ginormous and and kind of terrifying. Um, another possible source of fuel is hydrogen. Right, we saw that that's got a, a pretty large enthalpy of reaction, minus two hundred eighty six kilojoules. Uh, we could burn hydrogen directly, and because there's no carbon in it, we're not going to make any CO two. Um, are, it's kind of environmentally friendly. Our, our fossil fuels do produce carbon dioxide, and just straight hydrogen wouldn't. Uh, but there's some challenges in using hydrogen as fuel. Right? Uh, so one is production. You know, it does take. You, you can generate hydrogen by splitting water, right? So you take some H2O, right? You run some electricity through it, uh, and then you're going to generate some H2 and some O2. You know, the problem is, like, where are you going to get this energy from, right? And honestly, honest to goodness, I heard a, a politician legitimately say they were going to use the hydrogen to produce the energy to do the electrolysis. And I'm like, my dude, did you not pay attention when we said conservation of energy? And that's just not going to work, right? So um, you, that would have to come from somewhere. So now if you're getting that from from wind or if you're getting that from solar, right? Um, the other thing is storage, right? Storage and transportation. Um, you know, you can easily move electrons around, right? We've got a power grid to do that. But, you know, how are you going to store and transport hydrogen? That becomes a little bit trickier, um, you know, and let's say you want to talk about a hydrogen-powered car. Well, you know, how are you going to fill up a hydrogen tank? That's a little, that's a little trickier to do. How are you, are you going to generate the hydrogen at your fueling station and basically ship electrons from a central power source? Or where is that energy going to come from? So, you know, and sometimes it might be a viable alternative, like in a car, like, okay, I'm going to fill it up with, with hydrogen, but I remotely produce the energy that is used to split that hydrogen. Because there's no naturally occurring hydrogen, or at least very little, on our planet. Right? Most of it is locked up into something else, right? and a lot of it's locked up into water. Right? Um, free hydrogen, you can get that by treating natural gas. Um, so you can take your methane and uh, react it with water to form hydrogen and carbon, mo and carbon monoxide gas. Um, you can calculate that delta H using the sum of the bond, <laughs> sum of the standard state enthalpies of formation of the products minus the standard state enthalpy of formation of the reactants. So for carbon dioxide minus the enthalpy of formation uh, for the water, you're going to end up with uh, you're going to end up with minus 111 kilojoules, minus negative 75 kilojoules, minus 242 kilojoules per mole. And you get 206 kilojoules. So isolation of hydrogen from ocean water, right? So this is electrolysis, is going to require 286 kilojoules of energy 
for mole. It's actually going to be a little bit more than 286 because uh, you remember it's going to be minus 286 kilojoules per mole if you combust it. Right? So it's going to take a little bit more over potential to actually electrolyze it. So yeah, it's like zero sum here if you're doing this. Right? You might get a little bit more energy from combustion your hydrogen than you would get from making it, but you're also producing a lot of this carbon monoxide gas. So uh, electrolysis of water right, is really uh, one way we can do that. So you get, uh, you pass an electric current through water, you're going to generate hydrogen, right? So you take yourself a nine volt battery, right? And you, you put it into a container with some salt water and you're going to end up with some bubbles, right? Some of those bubbles are going to be hydrogen, and some of those bubbles are going to be oxygen. Right? Twice as many hydrogens as oxygens. Um, and you can make hydrogen at home. Right? And you can make oxygen at home. It's just not very efficient. And batteries, by the way, are like the least efficient way for us to store energy. Um, but the current source of electricity, to do that, is expensive. Um, another way you can do that is Fermentation of corn-derived starch to produce alcohol, so you can get some energy through alcohol. Uh, catalyzed decomposition of alcohol in a special reactor at 140 degrees C is going to produce hydrogen. That's the, remember, alcohol is going to be well, this guy. That's some, all right, so you can get some bacteria to, to chew on some sugar, and then they're going to poop out some carbon dioxide and some, some methanol or ethanol, right? Uh, you can thermally decompose water, so you treat water with just several thousand degrees, causing spontaneous decomposition of H2 and O2. Uh, but you need a practical heat source and a reaction container that are expensive. Lots of problems in, in storing and transporting hydrogen. The molecules decompose to atoms upon contact with metal surfaces. So a minuscule size of H2 atoms can migrate into the metal, making it brittle. So your containers are going to start to get really flaky, literally, over time. Pumping hydrogen at high pressures can cause a pipeline failure, right? So if you're going to move this hydrogen around in a pipeline, you're going to end up with a cracked pipeline. Uh, H2 leakage is going to be a potential environmental hazard, right? So a concentration of H2 can increase to um, 20 million ppm combined with O2 to form ice crystals. Uh, chemical reactions occurring on the ice crystals are capable of destroying the ozone layer. So uh, assuming the combustion of hydrogen gas provides three times as much energy per gram as gasoline, you can calculate the volume of liquid H2, which has a density of 0 0.0710 grams per milliliter, required to furnish the energy contained in 80 liters, or about 20 gallons of gasoline, at a density of 0.74 grams per milliliter. <coughs> so to calculate the volume of H2 gas, Liquid required, we've got a density, which is allowing us to convert between grams and milliliters. We've got, we're got we given 80 liters of gasoline, and we know its density. So to determine the mass of the gasoline, we're going to convert our 80 liters into milliliters. We convert our milliliters, our volume, into grams using the density, and we get 59,200 59, grams of gasoline. We can calculate, <coughs> step two is calculate the amount of H2 liquid needed. Since H2 furnishes three times as much energy per gram as gasoline, only a third as much liquid hydrogen is needed to furnish the same amount of energy. So our mass of H2 is needed. We're just going to take our mass of gasoline and divide it by three. So it's a third as much. And 9, 19,700 grams of H2. Since density is equal to mass over volume, the volume is mass over density, and the volume of H2 needed is going to be 19,700 grams divided by the density in grams per milliliter. Right? Milliliters would come up to the top. And we would end up with 277 liters. Right? So a pretty large container is going to be required to store that 277 liters of gas. So gases are going to occupy more space than liquids. Now, the use of hydrogen-absorbing metals that form a solid metal hydride might work. 
So you're going to take H2 and you're going to combine it with a metal to form some metal H2 solid. So hydrogen gets pumped into a tank with a metal and it's basically going to absorb some of that uh, hydrogen. It's going to form the hydride. The hydride is slight, the volume of the hydride is slightly more than that of the metal. And then hydrogen gets released from the hydride as needed. And we've got some other alternative energy sources out there. <coughs> um, oil shale, which is a compressed kerogen. Um, it's really, uh, that is like the bottom, uh, that isn't even in the barrel. It's like so not bottom of the barrel. Um, oil shale is like your last ditch, desperate, moldy pizza of getting oil. Um, it's expensive to get the oil out of oil shale. It's hazardous to do it. Some of the expense has been reduced a little bit because of things we've learned from uh, our, our, our fracking processes. We've gotten really good at fracking. And so some of that gets translated over to oil shale. Um, you can produce ethanol by fermentation. Uh, so you're basically taking the sugar and you convert it to an alcohol by using yeast. So you get your little yeasty beasties and they're going to convert your sugar into alcohol. So your plants are going to take sunshine, right? So a little sunshine. And the sunshine lands on the plant. Yay, there's a little, that's uh, supposed to be a leaf. There's some little plants, right? And then they're going to make some sugars. Right, and then the yeast comes along. It's supposed to be like a little thing. And then it's going to make some ethanol, right? Um, you know, the, it's not necessarily the most efficient process to do this. So like one joule of energy over here, right, is probably going to be less than a joule of energy by the time you get over to the ethanol. Uh, pure alcohol is... <laughs> tricky to use at low temperatures because it's going to freeze, right? So, you know, getting something that is an ethanol-powered car up in Alaska is not going to work out too well. Um, even even diesel has problems at low temperatures. So back when I was a, a wee lad uh, up north and they bought a new fleet of diesel school buses because they were going to save money because diesel fuel was cheaper, uh, and we would have cold cold days off because the, the diesel fuel would drop below its jellification point and when it turned into basically petroleum jelly and you'd have a gas tank full of Vaseline inside your school bus and obviously they couldn't drive it if it was in you know the kind of gelled state. Um, you can get seed oil, so you know go from the plant, have the plant make some oil and use that in place of diesel fuel. Uh, you know, technically you could have uh, you know, whale oil or fish oil or biodiesel. There's lots of different ways we can get alternative fuel. The thing is, you're always looking at, well, how much energy can I get? How expensive is it going to be? And what are my side effects?